Good evening and thank you once again for joining us in this latest session of Duke Reads. My name is Frank Stacio. I'm the host of a radio show called The State of Things here at North Carolina Public Radio, WUNC. And I'm very pleased to welcome Thay Volia Glimpf as our guest. She's Associate Professor of African and African American Studies and History at Duke. She teaches courses in Southern History and Women's History, focuses on the 19th century South and slavery and emancipation. She's currently the interim chair of the Department of African and African American Studies and earned her PhD from Purdue University. She is recently the author of Out of the House of Bondage, The Transformation of the Plantation Household, published this year by Cambridge University Press. She's also authored several articles on Southern history, the co-author of two volumes of Freedom, a d documentary history of emancipation series, also The Destruction of Slavery and The Wartime of uh, the wartime of Genesis. Uh, I said the wartime. Uh, uh, do, is there an extra? The wartime Genesis. Uh, Genesis. Yes, yeah. an extra. Uh, forgive me. <laughs> forgive me. I'm sorry. The wartime Genesis of free labor, uh, the Lower South, uh, is uh, the latter was a Lincoln Prize finalist, and both volumes won the Jefferson Prize. And I'm sure they got the title right. So I apologize <laughs> again. Um, she's currently working on two book projects, Women at War, a study of women in the Civil War, and a study of former Civil War soldiers in the uh, Civil War soldiers in Egypt. in Egypt, and is now the chair of the Organization of American Historians, uh, the Binkley Stevenson Prize Committee, a member of the Executive Council of the Southern Historical Association, and the Board of Southern Cultures. Is also a member of the Advisory Committee of the Abraham Lincoln Bicentennial Commission, and on the Advisory Council of the Lincoln Price Committee and the Gettysburg Museum Advisory Committee. And we're so pleased you had time to be with us. That's, <laughs> Thank you. That's wonderful. And of course, given your history uh, and your study in um, the Civil War and in slavery and emancipation, I guess it's not surprising that you chose this most excellent book. Uh, tell us more about this, though, and your choice. This book um, I chose because it's um, Interestingly, it's a book that I have not yet taught, um, but it's a book that to me, better than most books on slavery, captured the complexity, mm -hmm. um, particularly the, the moral complexity. It captures sort of the, the intimate world of slavery. And I don't think it mattered to me a matter so much that the book is about uh, centers around black people who were free and slaveholders. Um, they could have been white and slaveholders, and the problems, the complexities would remain. So um, I think it's just a fantastic, um, beautifully written, crafted work. It's a, it is, a, I think, f from a literary standpoint, this is the finest book we've had in all of our selections in terms of pure literature. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the complexity, and we'll get right to your first question, and uh, certainly we invite your questions that you may have thought about as you're reading the book, and anything that occurs to you as our conversation continues this evening, we'd be happy to hear from you and uh, talk about the questions. But you talk about this complexity. In Jones' novel, moral quandaries abound. And they present themselves as simultaneously the same and different to black and white slaveholders. And here's where I think, I think a book that centers on a black slaveholder does illustrate and highlight the complexity a little better than it might have otherwise, because the idea of, of caste, class, and social and economic order Mm -hmm. in, in, in my estimation, uh, are, are, are better highlighted than, than simple kind of race tropes that seem to play out over and over again when we try to talk about and understand slavery. Does that...? Well, to some extent, I mean, uh, for example, um, I think it's um, Moses, one of the characters in the book, who was the first um, slave purchased um, by Henry Townsend, the, the main character. Right. And it, it, Moses and other characters, too, think about and wonder about how God, how God could have um, allowed black people who are preeminently, predominantly slaves in the American South to be slave owners. And at some point, he says, God must be, not be, around up there. Mm -hmm. He must be absent. Um, so I think to the extent that um, it raises the issue of uh, mm, 
race in that way to the extent that it questions slaveholding as an institution um, by, by putting black people in the role of slave, hold, hold, slave owners, which they often were. I think something like half a million um, black people were um, uh, free and many of them owned slaves. So it does, I think for many people, it would make the, the world of slaveholding maybe more accessible and easier to, to confront, maybe. Um, so, and also, to some extent, we, we get to dismiss the whole subject if it was just about um, an, an archaic institution which we never should have uh, started and should have ended a lot earlier, but thank God that's over with. Mm -hmm. I think what this book illustrates is that the, the wound of slavery is still with us because many of the structures that allowed it and supported it may well still be in place. And so if you look at religion, take a man like John Skiffington. Okay, he and his wife are pledged never, they're white, pledged never to own slaves. They've come to this higher judgment and they're deeply religious people. But when it comes time to take the job of sheriff and go round up runaway slaves, that too becomes somehow his moral responsibility. Now what, what kind of social structure and social order would allow um, that responsibility to his society to trump what he believed to be his responsibility to God. Slaveholding society um, necessitates um, the uh, sort of what I call the capture of all white people. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just slaves who are captured, but non-slaveholding white people are also captured. And, and you can't um, live in the South and not be a part of the system. Right. Um, every job, every occupation is directly or indirectly tied to slave ownership or slave holding. And so a sheriff can never be independent. Mm -hmm. um, your, your moral position may be one thing, but um, as he finds, you can't, the only way you can hold to it is to quit. Right. Um, and so when he gets or is given a, a slave girl, of course, you know, what do you do? They take her and they try to treat her as if she's not a slave. And then there's this whole question that, that arises, you know, he sort of lust right. after her right. Um, right. or for her. And um, so I think one of the, the beauties of this book is that it, when it inserts white people who are not slaveholders, what it does is to show us how everyone becomes implicated, right. Right. how everyone becomes a part of the system and upholds the system. And so very poor whites who are corralled into patrolling. Right. Um, these people know that their class position is right. horrible. They know that the, the world they live in really um, doesn't provide any benefits for them except their whiteness. Right. And so they cling to that and slaveholders build the world in such a way that they can cling to it. Um, so you give them power, uh, the power to arrest any black person, whether slave or free, um, in any space outside of the slaveholders plantation. And so they feel empowered right. and at the same time they feel a part of the corrupt system and powerless. And that sense of powerlessness, I think, is what um, uh, ends in this story, um, ends up corrupting them and, and leading to ultimately the capture and sale of free black people. Right, right. Yeah. And, and so, and it's again in the name of law and order and in the name of God, in both cases, that's how corrupt and, and through the looking glass the system becomes. Exactly, and, and, and Jones keeps telling us that um, the characters keep saying um, this world um, is sanctioned by God right. and it's sanctioned by the law and even black slaveholders keep telling themselves uh, what we do is okay because it's lawful. It's lawful, right. which is Henry's. Henry's, if you've got a couple Henry. of motivation, one is it's legal and two is I'm going to be a better slave owner than anybody else. Which so is, better I should hold them than, than they be sold to someone else. Right, which is 
totally um, an impossibility. You cannot be a good master. You may, um, as Henry thinks um, he will, and he thinks this defines a good master. You can, say, provide better food than your neighbor, or maybe give more than two sets of clothing a year. But the notion that one can be a good master or mistress is just, um, in and of itself, right. um, indefensible and, and, and not possible. And he comes f flesh up against this when he, he's caught caught wrestling with Moses. And, with Moses. And, um, and Robbins has given him clear instructions on how to be a master. Right. You can't wrestle with your slaves. And, and, and to me, Jones doesn't, um, he very exper expertly um, doesn't push um, um, hard notions at us, the difficult ideas at us. He lets us sort of uh, work through them with him. And so the, the idea that one can uh, be a good master is demonstrated by, in the end, um, the clear um, refusal of his slaves to see him that way. It's right. demonstrated uh, by um, his master, Robbins, who tells him, you can't wrestle with people you own, and who ends up or who is himself wrestling with them and who, of course, is intimately wrestling um, because of his affair with um, a, a black woman. Right. right. And, that, and that whole, I mean, I think that particular image, because it strikes me, and, I, and when I read it, I thought to myself, it's interesting, they could have been playing cards, they could have been drinking together and telling stories. I mean, any one of those would have been transgressive, right. I assume, behavior. But it was, and it took me back to the Bible as well, and, and, and when Jacob, I believe it is, who wrestles with the angel. So this notion that, that good and evil, you're, you're, in, you're, in con, in, in, or you're contesting God, mm -hmm. you know, and you end up with a wound, which is, I guess, the other, you know, you end up and with a bad And you might hip. lose if you wrestle with them. And you might <laughs> lose, yeah. yeah. So, and right, there's no winning. You can't, right. when it's an indefensible institution, as you say, there really is no compromise. Right. There's no good way through it. Which brings us to our second question. Augustus and Mildred, uh, Henry's parents, are appalled that he would that he would become a slave owner. This is a bit of a uh, Henry was somehow surprised at this that they would uh, that I well I, I think he, <clears throat> he wasn't. You mean that they would be they, yeah. upset? Well, I think he wasn't too surprised um, because he does. So it keep took, it from it them. Took him a while to it tell took them. him a while to tell them yeah. that he was building a house. It yeah. took him a while to tell them that he had used his money to his first purchase had been a slave. Um, and they are astounded and they look at him and think, is this our son? Mm -hmm. um, how could this child that we helped raise um, turn out this mm -hmm. way? Um, his father says, how could you? Um, and his parents are just amazing people, of course, because they not only um, set themselves apart from the world that he creates for himself, but they, in the end, they're running an underground railroad station <laughs> um, out of their home, and um, he has no idea. And I think that's, the known world is so unknown to everyone in the book. Um, it's, on the one hand, it's this plantation where people know each other, but they don't know each other. And, well, and that notion, and, and we'll get to this in more detail later, but let's, since you raised it, it comes up right away in the book. The, the first thing we find are doctors, white doctors, who don't know about black diseases, they right. say. And so that's your first indication that these, however intimate these people appear to be, uh, and transparent their worlds are, there is one world that we know nothing about. Right. And, yeah, the doctors who... at least profess to know nothing about these people. Um, and, and, and I think what Jones is doing there is, is again, pointing out um, the work that race and racism do. Um, so physicians who earn their living taking care of black people because there's no other population for them to earn their living right. with in these regions um, don't know them. Um, and at the same time, we know from his history that many white doctors um, gain their medical knowledge by operating on 
enslaved people. Mm -hmm. So it's a quandary. Uh, right. Well, it's it's the the world you planned you expect to talk about, and the world that you first of all would be forgiven for not knowing about, and perhaps penalized for knowing too much about. Perhaps yes. In that in that, in that world. Uh, the other part of the second question: Why did they? Why did they not believe that you could be a better master? You, you touched on some of this, but again, it was the genius of Jones never to say what I kept expecting to hear, which is that that freedom is the most important thing, and no man can take that. He never puts that in the mouth of a character, or that God has given us this freedom, and no man can take it away. I kept expecting someone to say, and he doesn't. He really allows us to wrestle with what Augustus and Mildred seem to know in their heart, what they passed on quite clearly to their son, but never articulated in those words. No, he, Jones doesn't directly put it out there. He, he does suggest that freedom is messy, yeah. that it's not a clearly defined thing, um, that the boundaries to freedom are really um, unclear. And so even when people uh, are free, whether they're black or white, um, their worlds are unfree in some right. ways. Um, so I, Mildred and Augustus, Henry's parents, are, have spent their lives trying to obtain freedom. And, and the father, of course, works really hard to buy his freedom and buy his wife's freedom. And he buys a patch of land as far removed um, as he can from the plantation world. And when they go visit their son, um, they stay in the cabins. And so they know right. what freedom is in a way, and they know what slavery is. And when they are confronted with the son, after he's told them he purchased a slave, the father slaps or hits his son. Um, uh, he's so angry. And the son, in response, breaks the cane that the father hits him with. And the cane, of course, is the, 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 this beautiful piece of art, um, as well as a utilitarian thing that the father sells to make it earn a living. And he breaks it and he says, this is what mastery is. I can do this because I am a master. And um, it, it, parental it, disappointment can't get any. <laughs> <laughs> right. But that's it again. All of the many ways in which you can express freedom. Is freedom simply power? Is free, does freedom mean I can do what I want? Uh, does freedom carry any responsibility with it? Uh, um, and and I, that's, the, again, I think the genius of Jones in here is to, is to point to the ultimate question. What do we mean by that? What do we mean by that? Yeah. Um, um, the, the character, I don't know, I don't remember if this is one of the questions, but the character Alice. Oh, yeah. Um, who is my favorite. Yeah. Um, uh, Alice pretends to be insane, mm. and, and so no one expects her to work or really do much of anything, though she does work. And then at the end we learn that mm. Alice is taken, she has taken her freedom and is running a hotel, um, is she, and an artist, an so artist right. um, yeah. um, has created this world of freedom. Right. And so people, freedom, I think <coughs> it's, slaves understood what freedom meant, I think, better than anyone, because mm -hmm. they didn't have mm -hmm. it. And they saw sort of, they glimpsed it um, right. in, in, white, in the white world. And when freedom does come to them, um, they articulate a notion of freedom that's the most eloquent yeah. that I've ever read. Um, and I think that's what Alice does in her own way at the end of the book, or at least we see her doing yeah. it at the end of the book. It's a subtext in this whole novel, it seems to me, is the ingenuity of people who are apparently not free to express freedom. In other words, if freedom is universal and, um, and no one may take it away, then even the institution of slavery hasn't done that, so that there's one way or another in which we will express our ingenuity, our creativity at the very least. Right. And you see all of the creative approaches to managing yourself in this 
inhuman institution. Exactly. Um, this is in no way to justify slavery or to no. say, oh, well, let's do some more of that to, to bring out the creativity in all of no. us. We're not saying that. But it is an expression, again, of this. There is, there's something called political and legal freedom. And you right. can deny that. But the individual then finds a way to express ingenuity right. or creativity. But the human spirit, if you, if you can find a way to kill the human spirit, you can find a way to truly enslave people. Right. And so, so far, human beings, fortunately, have not been able to do that. And so the slaves in this book um, show over and over again um, what um, the power of the human spirit. Yeah. Um, and I'm thinking in particular of um, Elias, right, who um, wants nothing more than to run away oh, to right. freedom. Mm -hmm. And he finds love in a woman who is sort of discarded because she is not... Um, totally able-bodied, right? And he finds love with her, and that gives him a, a certain kind of satisfaction. And I was telling you before we started that one of my, that there, there are these wonderful um, lines in the book, phrases, and one of my favorite, and I can't quote it precisely, but when he meets her and falls in love with her, he tells her he's going to make a comb for every hair in her head and I mean, how romantic is that you know he has nothing but this ability to sort of carve um, and at the same time this beauty that slaves can find in their lives is um, also of benefit to their owners you know what does Henry say yeah um, if you can get them to marry hmm you own them because they're not going to run away or at least that will keep them from running away as much um, so slavery as an institution is a um, when you when you think of it in terms of the the strategies that slaveholders devised um, it's amazing right? um, let them marry because that's good for us. It will keep them in line. Um, and slaves are saying, okay, let's marry because that will give us a way to build a community and keep our spirits alive and survive. Um, but he doesn't let it rest. He doesn't make it that simple for us, does he? Because Moses is seen in the beginning, will, you know, saying, begging that his wife not be sold apart from him. Right. <laughs> By the end of this novel, the, the chance of power has him pushing his family away, literally sending them Literally, um, power corrupts the old yeah. saying. Um, so even someone who has been at the very bottom um, now wants to rule. Right. And so Moses sees himself stepping into the role of his former master and taking over. Um, and that is one of the, the real sort of um, important ways in which Jones um, makes this world so complicated. Right. Um, and he doesn't give us an easy out no. with any of the characters. Um, even people that we start off liking, we end up despising, right? Um, so every time you want to just break this along racial lines, along gender lines, along class lines, religious, every time you think you've got a fix on this thing, you know, he comes and blows it up and it's all plausible and it's an entirely, you know, as you, you, you're forced to meditate on the profundity right. of, and the universality of these possibilities. One man who lusts after freedom and risks his safety and, and his health f falls in love and finds uh, a creative outlet there. Another man who is apparently going to give up his life to stay with a woman gives her away when power begins to work at him and eat at him over a long period mm -hmm. of time. Mm -hmm. um, so we can't... And then, you know, and again, back to John Skiffington, the, the sort of high-minded white guy who then... But 
but that nobility brings him to the, conclu to the conclusion that he must be a good sheriff, and to be mm -hmm. a good sheriff, you have to bring mm -hmm. people back. You know, so let's, let's move on to our next question here, and also inviting your questions. We're happy to uh, include your questions and observations along the way. We have five questions here as a kind of structure for us, but anything that occurred to you as you read the book uh, is, is fair game today. So our third question is, if there is a known world, and he makes it clear that there's an unknown world, we talked a bit about this, maybe we can go into to more detail. Um, this, this business of what we know and what we don't know and how they begin to play against one another. And of course, Alice in particular, the, the kind of prophetic voice who disguises herself. Yeah, it's, it's questionable. What, what did you think? Do you think that it was a game with Alice? That, or did she, was she playing a game all along? Or was there her prophetic genius such that nobody got it until she could? Work? I think it was her genius. And I think in Alice, we see the genius of slaves in general. Um, she reminds me of um, a book by Walter Johnson called Soul by Soul, mm -hmm. which is the study of the slave trade, um, the domestic slave trade. And what he does in that book is to, to take us inside the world of slave traders and slave markets um, and auction blocks. And um, there you see slaves are sort of taking control even on the auction block of their lives. And, and so if masters are determined to dress you up for sale, uh, you might find a way to um, make yourself appear as to not be a good person mm -hmm. to buy to a pr prospective slaveholder. And so I think Alice is, is not, um, she's sort of representative of slaves in general in many ways in that she she feigns, she pretends. Um, and her pretension takes it to the extreme. Um, that is, that she goes all the way with it and pretends to be insane. Um, and I think it's very deliberate um, and uh, an amazing character um, that Jones has created because she does do the work of showing us um, um, what kinds of options and strategies slaves had available to them to undermine the system. I mean, you're always, to survive, you have to find a way to undermine the system because otherwise you can't survive. For Alice and for many slaves, it's, okay, um, do I, you know, what we call everyday resistance, do I break a tool today or not, um, milk the cow, and for her it's, I will pretend that I don't know anything. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, in the end of the book, um, Henry, um, not Henry, Augustus Townsend, when he's sold, what does he do? He pretends to be mute. Mm -hmm. um, and so he is then controlling the terms of the sale. And he's saying, you know, I'm going to, you can try to sell me, but I'm going to act like I'm stupid. And so no one will want to buy me. And it worked, right? Um, so. And, and, and it also strikes me, and, and it sheds a light on why the dominant group, in this case white slave owners, permit that kind of transgressive behavior, because she's insulting. She sings songs that are disrespectful about, you know, passing owners, and um, that are humiliating. And you would think, she plays in, in some ways the role of the jester, the, the one person in the court who has permission to sort of call the emperor naked, right. right? And you wonder to what extent that also plays a role in, in white society for relieving their, their conscience in a way. In other words, we're permitting this because yes, you're calling us out, so in a way we have to cop to it, so it's our confession. Um, and through this admission, and I'm talking about some very deep subconscious <laughs> kind of permission. Why do we give her permission? Why don't we just shut her up, even if she's harmless? How can you shut Isn't her? she embarrassed? Well, she's I mean, you embarrassing, know. and, um, and you can, the only way you can shut her up is to like, really beat her to death. Or I, I'm thinking of this wonderful uh, character, which is not a character. She was a real woman, a slave woman who... Um, when asked to remember slavery, um, and she said, um, whenever her master and mistress had company, 
she would go into the parlor and pull up her dress and say, beat me now. Because they were so accustomed to beating her, but they just didn't want to do it in front of right. company. So yeah. she let their company right. know right. that these people were horrible people. And so Alice um, makes fun of people, of, the, of right. her owners, and all the while that allows her to roam the um, world of the plantation at mm. night. And what she's doing at night, um, this unknown world, is helping slaves run away. Mm. And no one suspects this crazy woman uh, could be possibly capable of that. So um, slaveholders complained a lot about slaves who were disrespectful, especially slaveholding women. Um, but you can, if you take them seriously, then what does it say about your mastery? Mm. So your best choice is to try mm. to ignore them. Uh -huh. um, they're just crazy or, you know, um, you can write them off as sort of, uh, black people are just really funny, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we get that stereotype of blacks as um, humorous right. and carefree. Uh, because if Alice wasn't... Um, uh, sort of making fun of them. They just saw it as a carefree woman who was right. harmless, right? right. Uh, so I think slaveholders could not master their world. They didn't have the ownership that they thought, and, right. and it becomes then the real work of the slave population to understand that. So, yeah. the, so the genius is to see that particular weakness and vanity Right. and play on that. I right. remember during the Civil Rights Movement, it was very common for, you know, when, when this work was being done in mm -hmm. the South, mm -hmm. you'd hear uh, particularly white women saying, well, you know, we've talked to our servants about this, about all this civil rights business and these people coming in, and they say it's a, no a lot of nonsense. They don't want any part of this. Of course, and, and at so, night and they, they're they're in the there, there they are. They're yeah. out of, and yeah. so you think, well, now, did they really not know or did they not want to know? I mean, how, how could they have believed that they would have gotten an both, honest answer to that? But you don't want to know and that you also know, but to know is to recognize how That's tenuous the, your hold on on them is and how tenuous white supremacy is. And I think that at the same time, I don't want to give the um, suggestion or impression that slaveholders didn't have a great deal of power. They right, did, right. but slaves kept, um, they kept them on their feet. Um, mm -hmm, if you're mm -hmm. going to be master, you're going to have to um, really stay Just, yeah. Yeah, attentive so. here. Let's move on to our, uh, uh, our fourth point here. Uh, the institution of slavery left no one who came in contact with it unharmed or uninjured. Um, how in the life of Moses do we see this? And we started to talk a bit about his transformation. Um, yeah, I think we, we talked about that and, and how he um, goes from a person who um, is deeply committed to his family to one who is ready right. to just give them up completely in order to be uh, come a part of this world of mastery and power. Um, but I think the book in general, um, whether Jones is talking about the enslaved or slaveholders or free white people um, or free black people, he just shows how everyone is The contamination is thorough, um, and it, it how much um, awareness um, of that contamination it takes to try to move beyond it. Mm -hmm. um, so whatever um, quote unquote victories uh, enslaved people manage, um, then we understand better. Um, how much hard work went into that because we know how contaminating the environment was, um, that slavery was not just a matter of people being put to work in the field or being put to work in a house, um, but it sucked um, everything in, in right. its path. Um, 
and God um, becomes uh, a tool of the impressed, oppressed, uh, not a tool of the oppressors, I'm sorry, um, and slaves try to, to, to um, think about God in a very different way, right. but that tension is ever present. Always present. In the, and, and again, when you, you see the, the, the tension, you see the... Um, and a guy like Robbins, when he tried to break up Henry and Moses and then lay down the law and explain to him what it meant to be a slave owner, I, I, always, I sort of imagined this moment or several moments in Robbins' life when it occurred to him that this institution is wrong. It had to occur, have occurred to everybody. And there are these moments when it, it begins to crash in on you. And you've got two choices. You either confess and apologize and that means everything you've done up to that point has all been a lie and, and violent and wrong. Or you, or you rebuild that wall and you double the strength and you find any excuse you can to validate it. If a black man can become a good slave owner, then this means this institution was meant by God. God has truly ordained this institution because, look, even black men hold. So it's not just white people and black people. It's the institution that... that well, it does suggest a kind of generosity right, of, of white people that they will right. allow black people to become slave owners, too. Right. Um, and I think one of the interesting questions it raises is why they do it. Um, uh, surely they're just not generous, but um, it's fun doing, allowing that is fundamental to their um, um, sense of who they are, and even as it undermines the system, because uh, to have people who are black and free in a world that insists that uh, black people are inherently inferior and destined by God to be uh, slaves, uh, you are undermining the, the very system that you are creating um, and that white supremacy as an ideology um, uh, supports. But at the same time, human beings are really funny creatures and so they, they, uh, they allow black people to be free, um, they worry about them all of the time. And in fact, of course, in this book, it becomes clear that, um, you know, Augustus and Mildred, Augustus can buy Mildred, um, slaves can buy family members, but they can't always emancipate them. Because the law says that you can do this, but, you know, the black person has to leave the state. Um, or go back into slavery. And so it's a contradictory um, worldview, um, and it's just messy because slaveholding ideology is not um, coherent. Of course. It's very not. incoherent. And so slaveholders mm -hmm. like Robbins, as you mentioned, sure, I imagine that at some point he and others said to themselves, this is really wrong. but. At the same time, they went to the Bible and they said, you know, God doesn't say that this is wrong. Mm -hmm. um, they went to ancient history and they said slavery has existed for mm -hmm. all of humankind. But then when they came to their world, to their known world, well, at this moment, we have um, a democracy. Right. We believe in um, inherent rights and freedom. Um, this country is built on it. So that contradiction more than anything else I think would have made them stop but it made them stop but it also led them to a more assertive defense of the institution it's no longer a necessary evil but a positive good right? that's it it had to be in every every um, example I can have that validates that right. it just buttresses this wall because I, I really don't like those pangs that I feel periodically when I'm but I'm to doing something the really good. Yeah, you know, look uh, at how good this yeah, is. These yeah. are people who clearly have bought into the institution. Um, I, I want to talk more about the literary the style of this because I know you feel very strongly as I do that it's a, it's a remarkably well written book. And isn't it interesting that when you read, uh, Jones himself said he didn't do a whole lot of int uh, uh, research on slavery. Well, I don't want my graduate students to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, because they labor in the archives trying to put these stories together, um, and uh, so do I. So, yeah, it's amazing that he, 
could write this book without research um, or extensive research because mm. it it captures the world of mastery and it captures the tensions and the contradictions and complexities. Um, so it's a literary book. It's one of the best. Um, um, I think people might quarrel with him um, in terms of, well, the world of free blacks um, as depicted here uh, may seem too sort of perfect. You know, you have this community mm -hmm. of free black people. They seem to sort of navigate their space with a great deal of freedom, mm -hmm. um, the free black community. And that, mm, I think, um, doesn't ring as true to me um, as the real world. Um, in some places like Charleston, you might have more of that, but... Um, Which suggests that perhaps his intuition as, as a really deep writer, um, that he's able to look at contemporary events and almost universal characteristics. Mm. Um, in other words, the truth of this is attached to an institution called slavery, which we experience in the United States, but is present today in other institutions and other structures, and certainly in human behavior. Certainly in human behavior, yeah. um, uh, the, power, um, the way it works through the way we organize ourselves hierarchically. I mean, right. we still live in a very hierarchical world. Right. Um, and Jones gets that. And I think um, from what I've read about his background, that really helped shape um, his understanding of that uh, growing up. Um, um, in D.C. and yeah. um, in a home with a mom who could not write and so or, or was illiterate and I, I think um, maybe better than a historian or a scholar who is, uh, spends their entire summers in the archives to sort of feel for human beings, feel mm -hmm. for people who are at the bottom um, certainly helped to shape and craft uh, this book. Yeah. Joanne has a question for us, wants to know if you had any trouble with the author's style of going back to the past and present and kind of leaping into the future, uh, which was, I thought, a, a kind of Where a wonderful technique, uh, Joanne, oh, at the, the bottom. Point. Did you have any trouble with the author's style of going from present to past to present? I didn't. I, I think the book is very... Um, it's hard to get through because you have to keep recalling um, the the characters and keep track of who they are and and follow them, um, and so there it is difficult. Um, but um, and so in saying it's difficult, yeah, I had a little trouble. <laughs> but mm -hmm. I think um, in the end, I found it to be uh, um, just a really excellent way of telling the story. Yeah, I find it fascinating. I had less trouble with that than I did the characters. It was, as you said, it was very hard to kind of keep. And again, he's blowing up all your stereotypes. So, right. so you have people in categories, and he just takes them all out and starts shuffling them around, lots of them. But when he went backward and forward in time, that, again, was, was ingenious in the sense that he would say, this would be the place where he would, he would die in, you know, not 20 yards from this very place. Um, the idea that there's a kind of circle of time and that we're all sort of, that, that today and in 1976, I think he pointed to a, what I'm sure is a fictitious report, a report uh, written in 1976 would show that this and that happened, but in fact, here's what they were experiencing. All of that helped you see the difference between the way we perceive our, you know, what's happening to us, how it's going to be written about. You remember he has the folklorist come in and mm -hmm. try to extract stories and we're hearing layer upon layer. So there's what he exposed in real time, there's how it was remembered shortly thereafter, and then the, the, the prospect of this report a century later and how that's going to reflect it. He's, he's a genius. Um, uh, this, he constructs this world and he knows every space mm. in it. Um, on this landscape. And he has in his mind um, 
where people are located, and he, and he mm. moves them around on the landscape, and we follow him back and forth, back and forth, until by the end of the book, this world in Manchester, is it Manchester, yeah, exactly. Virginia, becomes a known world, um, and at the same time, uh, we imagine that we still know so little uh, about the institution of slavery, which again is a, a remarkable feat. I, I am very envious of his <laughs> ability to do this kind of work because yeah. it, he is doing the work that um, historians who specialize in different aspects of slavery do, you know. I, some people specialize in the market. Some people specialize in what goes on in the fields. And, and he has it all um, in this one book. And he seems so expert at um, um, grasping the ground on which people lived and in, in seeing and knowing um, that people have to, um, the way I think of it, people have to have room to breathe. Mm -hmm. And so how do slaves breathe um, in a system that's so corrupt and so oppressive? Mm -hmm. And so he has them finding all of these ways yeah. to breathe, whether it's Alice helping people get away or it's um, someone sheltering someone's child or, or, or crafting a cane and, and not just um, carving a cane but turning it into a piece of art right, right. Um, and then using the box that you ship the canes of to the north to sell to ship a, a person um, to get that person to freedom just masterful and the, per the way again layers of perception uh, or the way various perceptions are layered even in the box Imagining what the people on the first we we get into the mind of was it who is who is sent in the box, but we get into her mind, and she's imagining what's going to happen when they is open this box, yeah. and then there are voices, actual voices coming from the outside, and they surprise us in their reaction, and so, and I wonder if there's anything historians can learn from this technique of saying of um, looking at various layers of perception and saying, you know, how do we get at what happened when we see so many ways of reflecting the experience, the contemporary reflection, the near, you know, uh, mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. history reflection, mm -hmm. and then the long-term reflection. Is I think there we try, we, but we can't do what yeah. he can do. Um, we're limited um, in, in the way in which we can imagine um, uh, worlds in the past. Mm -hmm. But I think it, that his way of showing us these different levels um, uh, works so well that you 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 can you can you, it's like you can feel this box around you. You can feel right. the canes on top of you. You can feel the, the water that he puts in the biscuits that he puts in the box right. so that she can survive. Um, right. Well, let's move on to our, okay. our last question. How did the law of slavery both protect free black people and deny them protection, uh, the rights of citizenship? We talked about some of this too. The law said that you could, you know, slaves, every free black people had um, certain rights. Um, but as Jones makes clear, um, I think, especially when Augustus is so, right. that. Um, those rights are very limited. Mm -hmm. They're limited um, in certain ways by geography. You step off of the, the, the square world or mm -hmm. space in which you exist, then your body, you, can be transported to a different world. You can be sold. And, and again, in, 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 in telling that, uh, uh, constructing that scene, he also gives us additional insight into um, how whiteness um, is made and, and that any white person can say that you are not free. Um, and so the law says that, okay, um, we will allow for the existence of free black people, but we will confine that uh, you in that world and, and we don't really want you in 
our world. And I, I think this is important because even when we get to the Civil War um, and the people in this world who have been waiting for this and planning for it, um, in the real world, in the real South in 1860, um, they were planning and waiting and ready to go. And then you had President Lincoln saying, okay, even when I get to the point of thinking that emancipation is a good thing or maybe possible, I want you to know that it's not possible for you to stay here as free black people. So think about where you can go, some tropical place, and so Congress passes a law and says, we will fund you uh, to remove yourselves to some tropical place, um, Haiti or uh, Cuba or back to Africa. So there's always this sense that um, free blacks don't belong mm -hmm. um, in America. Um, and is that because it, then, then free blacks stand as an indictment against the system? It's Suddenly we're indictment. forced to confront what, that this was wrong all along. Right. If you, really if you can survive right. um, without slavery, then everything that we have presented as a defense of the institution is wrong um, and can't be justified. It's and even that, even at that, we don't get the response that we would expect. I think about Celeste who miscarried because of Moses uh, working her so hard in the field. And yet when he's hobbled and uh, needs any affection and attention, she, it's precisely Celeste who is a super, who, who shows a superabundance of love. It's the only way you can describe it. How mm -hmm. can you take this man in mm -hmm. um, and cares for him? So here, too, you don't expect anybody to show that much forgiveness. And we certainly didn't expect Moses to end up where he ended up, so right. bitter and so. Mm -hmm. And then there they are together, so. There they are together. Um, very human and very complex. Mm. Um, slavery could not deny huma the humanity mm. of the slaves. Um, it could not erase it. It could try, mm. but never succeeded. Um, so the known world in the end leaves us with an unknown world and turns our world upside down over and over it, again. You can it read does this book. Do that. How many times have you been through, read this book? Because I, 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 it's a book that's difficult to get through. We have to say because of the number of characters, and yet I'm guessing uh, this is one of those books that's different every time you read it. I've only read it once closely, yeah. and um, it's a book that I do want to incorporate into my classes and teach. Uh, um, and I went back through it, uh, um, not uh, well, but I went back through it for this program. And, uh, and so I will read it again um, in order to determine how I'd like to teach it. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, yeah. an ingenious book, and again, one that I think would, would keep, uh, keep you on your toes every time you go through it. Well, thank you very much. Um, any parting thoughts or...? Uh, and, and I know you wanted to talk about the literature, too. I hope we got to some of the passages you wanted to... Oh, well, I, I did. I, I, but I think if I had um, a last word, it would be that um, I work on, on, on women um, mm. to quite an extent. And what amazed me about this book was his understanding mm. of women, both white and, um, and black, and, and his understanding of the power that slave holding women had. There's a scene in the book where he talks about a two slave women who have virtually imprisoned their mistress mm -hmm. and forced her to work. Um, and that's what my work is all about. <laughs> um, how slave women um, found a way to, to say to white women, we are women too. And um, you're sort of subordinate position as a woman doesn't mean that you are not powerless. And so I think Jones, he has um, found a way to bring our attention to so many facets of this world of slavery and to complicate our understanding of it. And um, for that, I think we owe him a great debt. Him and you for bringing it to our attention, if it hadn't been already, although it is a Pulitzer Prize winner. But thank yes. you so much. Thank Great you. talking with you, Frank. Thank you.
Uh, Thavolia Glimpf is uh, our guest today. Of course, the book, The Known World, Edward P. Jones. And uh, thank you very much. We remind our participants that this session is going to be available on iTunes in the next day or so. Next session, April 22nd, R. Sanders Williams of Duke Med School will be here to discuss Copenhagen. And uh, we'll field your comments all along the way and again on April 22nd when next we meet. Thank you so much and good night.